Um, this is another of my uh, interviews with people who I think can explore the idea of the Open Tribe. And welcome to Victor Abadouali, who I've known for, all 20-ish years um, have, yes. as a thinker and a provoker. And you're very a generous. Ideas generator and you're a crossbench peer. I'm a crossbench peer, Which yeah. is fascinating for the purposes of this conversation because you're in politics, but you're not a political party exactly. representative. I'm in politics, but not a lot. Exactly, in a sense, where we're trying to investigate. So, and this is the week after the elections in which UKIP did so well, and so I'm just interested in 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 that question in terms of how that changes politics. It's it they haven't just taken votes from the Conservatives; they've taken votes mm. from the traditional Labour yes. heartlands. Um, and we were talking um, off camera about the idea of solidarity. Yeah. Have a think with me about what solid solidarity might mean in this context and what the implications might be of, mm. of the UKIP vote. So there's a couple of things. Firstly, um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the UKIP vote's changed politics. It's changed political tactics. To change politics, I think, would involve quite a shift in what we think politicians should do and what politics is for in this country. What UKIP have done is tap into a deep well of dis-ease with the current debate which hasn't touched a deep well of anger about the bankers crisis, mm. about the um, changes that are being made in a way that um, uh, people don't feel consulted about and about the fact that politicians of all parties have tended to see their role as making things simple for the people instead of explaining, instead of bringing people to complexity which is, so what UKIP have done is make things simple and people have got used to that you know, you've got a problem with housing, it's immigration <laughs> if you've got a problem with, um, with budgets it's Europe, you know, very simple. So they haven't broken the mould, this is old I don't politics. Think, I don't think they've broken the mould at all, and in fact, you know, I think that what they've done is, 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 take, is take the old mould and represent it to a public that's hungry for something that's simple. <laughs> but that's not the same thing as changing politics, I think that's very old politics actually. So what would a politics be like that introduced people to complexity? Well, I think it would be, I think you have to start, you do have to start with where people are at. But it starts with not assuming that people don't want, aren't interested. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, so you take the question of, of immigration, for instance, and the fact of the matter is that most economists that I know of um, consider that this country needs immigration, needs it now, will need it in the future. And the best brains, um, yes, we are generating some, but quite a few of them are coming from outside. So what kind of economy future economy um, does without immigration. Now most people actually can understand that, but you have to explain it to them, then you have to allow them to interpret it in terms of their world, and then you have a discussion. Um, and we were talking off camera about the difference between, I suppose, prosthetizing a position, advocating, and inquiry. And there's a lot of advocacy in politics, you know. We, I want you to believe this, as opposed yes. to, well actually, this is the situation as we see it. What do you think? <laughs> and can we move towards something over time which is credible for both sides? And even when politicians consult the public or hold public meetings, they still yeah. tend to be telling meetings of where yeah, you yeah. Know, people make loads of speeches yeah. on the platform and yeah. then there's five minutes QA exactly right. at the end. Well, they're rarely that. I mean, I'd say that most public meetings with politicians I've been to are managed to within an inch of their lives. And you can always tell, I always think it's really funny when you get these pictures of politicians on the platform on TV and behind mm -hmm. them, they used to do it in front, now they do it behind. The, the, the screen is full of happy, smiling people, all suggesting that they're members of the Labour Party or the Conservative Party or UKIP, and it's utter nonsense. <laughs> and most people think it's nonsense. But the, the, we've got quite sophisticated at arranging, at, at giving an impression of consent. Um, but I think politics deals with real emotions and complexity. Well, and the... The issues are very good. I was listening to a debate on the radio yesterday, driving along, about immigration. Mm. And there were people from the Asian community and Afro-Caribbean people being interviewed, as mm. well as 
uh, you know, white working class, mm. all saying different versions of, I'm not against immigration, but there's too many people after my job, my yes. house, yes. That, it, that, that you're, we're squeezing people in, yes. it's not work. It, mm. In a sense, it's about the technicality it is. It of is. fitting lots more people into it, the spaces it, that we've got, rather is. than, it wasn't angry or even fearful, no, it was no. quite a rational no, conversation. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I've got no problem with people talking about um, immigration. As long as we're clear, you see, I think there are, again, different levels of that conversation. I'm not convinced that when you keep talk about immigration, they're not really talking about race. In fact, frankly, yeah. I'm not that convinced that any of the parties, when they talk about immigration, are not talking about race. And the reason why I'm not convinced is that they don't make it clear. Unless, you, unless they're attacked, and then they say, of course, we should be allowed to talk about immigration without being accused of racism. Well, if you're talking about immigration, why should you worry about it? You know, so there's, there's, there's lots of um, subtexts, I think, in the immigration debate. Actually, most people, the people that you listen to, can talk about immigration perfectly innocently, expressing concerns, which are perfectly rational, about the limited, their perception of limited resource, um, their concerns. It's interesting, isn't it? The immigration always becomes an issue when there's a recession. <laughs> yes. Um, because it's natural. People think, well, hang on a minute, my job's at risk, who is it at risk from? But the response is those people who have the, the power of knowledge should actually be prepared to share that knowledge in a way that's fairly unbiased. You know, are you at risk from, um, is your job really at risk from immigrants? Really? I don't know. You know? But is it? Which jobs? Where? <laughs> and it's that process of inquiry that breaks us out exactly. of the stereotypes exactly. and the knee-jerk reaction, because exactly. actually, this is a complex question, exactly. and the left tends to fall into the same f mistake of just going, there isn't a problem. Yes. Actually, there might be there some might be. bits of problem well, well, there might be, you see, about it, something. Yeah, there's the problem of perception, and yes. then there's the problem, and you have to deal with both. So what politicians have a tendency to do, the default position, is to deal with the perception and leave the problem. So they deal with the perception by saying, well, there's a perception out there that immigration is a problem. Great. It's a problem. We'll tell them it's a problem and our solution is to stop immigration. Well, that's not dealing with the problem. The problem that people are expressing is actually fear about resource. Yes. That's the problem. So, but you have to deal with the perception as well, and it can often be dealt with, I think, by treating people like adults, you know, adult, adult conversations about, well, how true is that? These are the facts. These are. Now, some people won't accept those facts, but most people, most people actually are quite rational, you know, or, or will be open to a rational conversation. And you're right, we don't hear politicians very often. If somebody says, you know, there's too much immigration, you never hear a politician on the television going, that's interesting. Mm. What makes you think that? Yeah. What's been your experience? Is, Tell me some more. True? Yeah, is yeah. it true? Yeah, you know, let's I explore it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the job question is a really interesting one. You know, if you go to some of the rural areas of Lincolnshire, for instance, um, uh, white men, you know, won't, 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 pick, won't pick cabbages in the fields of Lincolnshire. Actually. Normal young white teenagers. Exactly. Why, and, and frankly, you know, uh, and then they complain about these people coming over and doing that job. Well, now, and, and I've listened to similar debates where when that's put to them, they'll say, well, you're right. <laughs> and they'll say, well, it's because these people drive the wages down. Actually, it's not that these people drive the wages down, it's that they don't want to do that job. And actually, that's a, rush, that's a conversation about the shape of an economy and what people, you know, and that's a conversation worth having with people. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about, you're thinking about, uh, I've used the word solidarity, I'm not sure if it's the right word, but the Labour movement has a history of, of solidarity, but, you know, I did my research about Bermondsey in the 20s mm. and 30s. That solidarity was... Uh, in defence against sometimes women workers, sometimes uh, the unemployed, sometimes mm. immigrants. Uh, for anyone who's black, the idea of working class solidarity must be a bit of a mixed yeah. thought and experience. Yeah. Yeah. Does the word carry any value still? Do we st and is there a different sort of solidarity? What would that be like? Well, I think it has a lot of romance associated with it. I mean, I, um, the solidarity that kind of makes sense to me, oddly enough, if you look at the beginnings, I mean, you mentioned race, so it's worth, you know, um, 30th of April was the anniversary of the Bristol bus boycott, which was the beginnings of, um, of um, 
race policy effectively in this country as a result Harold Wilson introduced the Race Relations Act and we got the reduction of the no dogs, no Irish, no blacks um, stuff it was seen as unreasonable. Now uh, what happened in Bristol was that the black community was created a solidarity. Actually the unions, the Transport and General Workers Union were actually anti the employment of black people on the buses which is why there was a boycott in the first place. So Let's be clear, mm -hmm. <laughs> solidarity can mean the same as tribalism. Yeah. Um, the, the unions were at absolute solidarity against these black people who were trying to get work because the, the union saw its job as to protect the jobs of white men against these effectively black savages. In fact, one of the reason, one of the rationales given for not allowing black people to work on the buses was would you want your, your, your wife or your daughter to be alone with the black man on, on a bus at yes. night? Because you know, God knows what happened. That's that's true. So uh, when people talk about solidarity on the left, for me, um, I'm quite sceptical about mm. about what they mean. And and usually what they mean is is romantic. It's not the truth. Now, um, having said that, uh, the left fought the fascists in Cable Street, um, uh, but that fight involved. Uh, black, well, black in the political sense, uh, certainly um, uh, uh, Jewish uh, people fought uh, alongside white people, alongside Huguenots, you know, fought the fascists and thank God. So I, I have a, I, I think I have a much clearer view of, of, <laughs> of the history of, of solid, I, I, I separate the romantic ideal mm -hmm. from the actuality and the actuality is that it, it is rare in history for people to come together across all kinds of boundaries in the pursuit of the progression of humanity's rise. Usually in politics, we don't notice people. We just no. don't notice that they're people. No. We just treat them as categories or... Uh, and we don't see the separateness of people no. as a as a good thing, we no. want to block him together. Absolutely. And actually, when you stop yeah. and just think, my yeah. God, people are so yeah. amazing. You have to start there. I mean, I think politics starts, and if your history of politics, it started there, it started with human beings. And, and the problem with that is that the challenge has been that leadership ceased to be about human beings and, and became, political leadership, became about expedience and power and winning. Now, this is, that's a terrible statement to make because I know politicians on the left, right and the middle who don't take that view. But there is an ongoing battle, in my view, for the human in all of us. <laughs> so is this some of this sort of the mass production of politics and, you know, like we get mass produced bread and it tastes mm. rubbish. If we've got mass produced politics that's mm. rubbish because it's, it's at scale and mm. it doesn't pay attention to... Emotion. I mean, if we were to bring those words back into politics, yeah. I'm just trying to imagine the Palace of Westminster yeah. <laughs> operating well, according to wisdom and wonder. And but what what would change? What would it be like? Well, I think you would probably need to change the language quite dramatically, obviously. But I I think that people, you know, I don't. I think people can relate to. I mean, don't get me wrong. Whenever the you know the prime minister was to go on the TV and say, you know, I love you. That would be well. The, the hug a hoodie was yeah, the sort of hoodie and the, know, the press the leap on it, and it becomes a you know, is he mad? And what's he been smoking? And all this sort of stuff. But the job of the leader is to take people from where they are to where they haven't been. <laughs> yeah. And in order to do that, if you use the same words and the same language, don't expect people to move. <laughs> Don't expect people to move. And if you look at your leaders throughout history, the ones that fo we, that we followed, they use different language, even to describe the same thing. So yes. when we're talking about um, immigration, there is something that perhaps we should start with. Well, what is it that these people are human beings? Or what is it about, what is, what is the wonder of this society, which is actually quite wonderful? London, 300 languages spoken. You know, people contributing to the economy that, you know, 60 years ago would not have been allowed to contribute to the economy, that have effectively built it. You know, Lord Noon, who came here penniless and has built, a, you know, a global industry from London. Are we really saying that we're not going to allow that to happen? We're going to remove, we're going to reduce the possibility 
of that happening. That's the kind of language that people understand because we don't wish to open our arms, we don't wish to wonder about this stuff. We don't wish to wonder about the, the capacity of our human being. Of our human well, we could wonder why they haven't built human. any housing for the last 50 years, which well, is why because, we've suddenly created well, some and that, problems. And that leads to the next argument. Well, you know, that leads to the next discussion. I think the whole thing about, um, well, if we're going to have um, uh, immigration, we're going to have a thriving city, then that city has to provide housing. And the question then is, how do you do that? And who does it? And, and all kinds of um, solutions fall out of that in terms of, you know, if I'm a major employer in London, if you think about it, going back to the beginnings of social housing, it was the major employers who thought, you know what, we can't have people living in garrets, it's, unha it's unhealthy, it doesn't work, you know, it's uneconomic, basically. Well, perhaps we might want to return to some of those conversations about what the major employers contribute to a city which they take from, you know, take from. Maybe it's a perfectly valid conversation, you know, it's that. But you have to start somewhere. And the worry is that we start with a very... We start with assumptions about what people will hear, what they will listen to. We, we don't treat them like, like people who have any wonder or people who expect wisdom from their leaders. There was another word you used which was progression. Yes. And I want to come back to progression because in a sense if that, that's a different sort of way of describing where we're going. Mm. Um, mm. And the conversation we've been having in Compass is about the good life, and I'm not quite sure how the two things fit yeah. together. So we've been sort of saying, what for us would be the good life? Mm. So I'd be interested in, in knowing what your thoughts are about that. Mm. But also, is there an idea that has that humans progress, mm. that our society progresses? And if so, mm. what do we want it to progress towards? Well, I'll start with the question of progression. I think there's an innate sense in most people of backwardness. And what I mean by that, of, of wanting to be seen as more than a resource to someone. Right, so what I'm, so even, when I, when I was a road sweeper, I back in Wakefield, I was, yeah, I was <laughs> it taught me an awful lot. Um, when I swept the roads, I observed that some people treated me literally like an expendable, a non-person, right? Others treated me with a kind of confused respect. They, they, they wanted to respect me as a human being, but they, he's a road sweeper, that <laughs> kind of thing. And others just saw me as a human being and actually were, were intrigued and got into conversation with me. And da, da, da. The people that I really, obviously people that I really valued were people who treated me like a human being and da da da. I've learned, I think most people want to be treated like that. So progression for me is a society in which every individual treats every other individual like a human being, with wisdom, with wonder, with love. <laughs> That's progression. And that the structures that we create um, pursue that aim. Now, that's progress. That's progression. The opposite of that is is. Um, a society in which, and, and actually I think there's an inbuilt human, almost energy, which moves away from this, you know, in most societies, where you are slotted, you are a unit, a functionary whose only role is to give someone else, who you may not know, you may not, you certainly don't care about, and they might not know care about you, some position, you know, you produce money for them, you produce you know, fear, respect, whatever. People, there's a resistance. You know, there's something, there's something about the human condition which rejects that. The state mm. and politics mm. is often about the state mm. is not a place that we first think of as the source of wisdom, wonder and love. Mm. What a shame. And... You know, in a sense, you know, all the, after the scandal in the House of Commons about expenses and all the rest mm. of it, we didn't see our elected representatives as abounding in wisdom and <laughs> wonder Some and love. Not all of them, yeah. Um, and we had this conversation, I mean, in a sense, having a conversation with, with um, Hilary Cotton about um, mm. working with troubled families and mm. about whether the state can have relationships, whether it can be kind, whether it can love, mm. you know, in a sense, if people are part of a bureaucracy, mm. how does a bureaucracy interface with humans? Yeah. Um, and what is it, have, 
that we've done to our social services in terms of turning them into bureaucracies and performance management machines rather than treating professionals we've as individuals having relationships. So, you know, what we've met the target but missed the point yes. for most of our public services. So, what do we need to do there? Well, uh, we need to go back to the first principles. So, the question, I, I just, I find it really boring when people say to me, uh, as they do, usually on the right, but sometimes on the left, you know, bureaucracy is terrible, the public sector is bloated, it is too this, it's too that. And I think about that and I think, hmm, so Tesco's isn't then bloated? Or um, is kind, is it? Um, what do you mean? What do you, what do you actually mean? <laughs> Beyond a prejudice. <laughs> so, of course it is possible for bureaucracies to create, to be kind. It's all about the culture of the people that run the bureaucracies. I'm not anti-bureaucracy. I crossed the road, for God's sake. I wouldn't get across it without some form of bureaucracy. <laughs> you know, it's just nonsense to say... To, you know, and the people that would want to replace bureaucracy with something else usually associated with the private sector don't think the private sector has bureaucracy. I mean, what are they talking about? It's yeah. just utter nonsense. Um, the question isn't about bureaucracy. The question is about services to the people <laughs> and how you want those services to the people to look and the culture of those services and the interface that, that individuals have. And what we understand now about services to the public is that those services should treat people like individuals, not numbers. Funnily enough, that's exactly what any service would want to do, regardless of whether it's paid for by the taxpayer or paid for by somebody who buys Virgin or some other such product. So there is an, there's an, a discomfort in the public sector bureaucracy about treating people as individuals because bureaucracies need to treat people equally and to, without fear or favour, and to be rule, you know, the sort of barbarian rule governed nature of bureaucracies, which what prevents corruption or prevents people being ad yeah. advantaged at the expense of someone else, or people being particularly yeah. kind to their cousin, or you know, all those sorts of things. I always that's I, their obsession. Isn't yeah, it? I always think you know whenever somebody quotes a, a particular position and ideology around anything, I always think. Unless ideology is capable of actually learning from experience, then it's not really ideology, it's dictatorship. <laughs> and what you've just said about bureaucracies strikes me as, well, it just lacks learning. I mean, what are we saying here? You say, you know, it's possible to treat people like human beings and still treat them with a modicum of equality. Nobody's expecting the housing officer to treat me any different from you. It's simply that we Our both expect. will be different. Yes, and we both expect to be treated with care, kindness, maybe a little wonder, and wisdom. It's not rocket science because actually, when we go to our bank, we expect exactly the same. We might not get it, and certainly as a public, we haven't got it from many of our banks. But it's the same. They are services to the public, who, by the way, whether they're in the public or private sector, we permit to provide us with that service. Well, and in the well, I mean, I suppose right up until about the 80s, probably, we saw individual professionals in the public sector as autonomous professionals with their own judgment, wisdom, mm -hmm. doing what they see fit. GPs are about the only people wisdom. left in that space, and mm. even that's disappearing. Mm. Mm. Uh, for 20 or 30 years, social workers and teachers haven't had that sort of public respect as people who are individual autonomous professionals able to make mm. their own judgments they've mm. been performance managed mm. and controlled and mm. vilified mm. is that a trend we need to change yeah well that's not a shortcut to the kind of public services to the public that people want you know? <laughs> i think that's fairly clear you know um and it's not the shot it's not the it's not the place people want to work in i would challenge i would challenge the, the assumption that that trend is inevitable or certain you know the trend towards, towards performance, um, management. performance management um because what we've learned is that um uh, for instance we know i mean anybody could have told you that targets in and of themselves don't produce necessarily improved performance they yes. produce people who perform to the target which isn't the same thing so or gaming we, Oh, yeah, that's what I mean, really, you know, gaming. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we are slightly more, we are more sophisticated than we were. 
Um, I do, yes, there is a tendency in across all sectors, this isn't just a public sector thing, to take a shortcut. You know, well, if we can turn it all into burger flipping, then everything will be fine. Um, but the public um, generally don't respond well to burger flipping. Unless it's necessary. There are some jobs that you just need to do very well all the time. If you're a receptionist, actually, the way in which you answer the phone needs to be excellent every single time. Not robotic, but excellent every single time. You know, time limits, five rings, all that sort of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm simply saying that the culture in which we... The cultures are created. <laughs> they're not accidents. And the culture in which we create, in, in which we deliver services to the public across public, private, and indeed not-for-profit institutions, is something we can change. And I think the public, who give permission for all this to happen, ultimately, um, deserve and want better. So last question, which is about the good life, which is in mm. the sense where we started. You know, what's, what's your idea of the good life? Well, sitting having a chat, actually shooting the breeze, actually with old friends, and having a. Ch I haven't done this for a while, actually. It's really quite interesting. Um, I mean, I feel God. Philosophers have raged about the good life. I think, I think, everyone should have an opportunity to live a balanced life, and people suffer when they're forced into imbalance, unbalanced. Mm. So, you know, we talk about health. I mean, you know, I sit on the board of NHS England. I work for an organisation uh, that delivers health and social care. I'm turning point. I do um, a, a variety of things. And what I've noticed is that the people that are most ill at ease, who don't lead a good, don't lead a good life by their definition, are people of, who, regardless of their income, regardless of their income and their wealth lead lives of that are unbalanced you know they, they don't have and it's not just well it is about choice but it's about the the being forced into a single track either by your own psychological makeup mm -hmm. or which is a complex and multivariate subject or by by imposition expectation posture so the good life from for me is one in which you are you are you have the ability and the privilege to balance your many roles, your wishes, your wants, um, and that you're allowed to live with what I think it was Freud talked about ordinary unhappiness <laughs> um, with dignity. So we've got dignity, we've got love, we've got wisdom, we've got wonder. I'm taking all those words away and <laughs> progression. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. No, no, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rose.